this first uh, class, I selected this topic. Did pre-modern India have a sense of history? And um, this is something which has been very much discussed. I am not exactly going to break new ground. But I thought it would set a nice backdrop to the whole course in a way. Because, let me begin with where it all starts. There has been a long tradition, if I may say so, among Western, um, initially Western and European, uh, more particularly historians and scholars, to decide that Indians didn't have a sense of history. And one of the most influential historians of the 19th century, James Mill, uh, who wrote a monumental uh, history of British India, uh, this was a, actually a prescribed textbook for the ICS course in the 19th century, and it was extremely influential. Um, it was a book that actually demonized uh, um, uh, Indian civilization rather than trying to have an objective assessment. Almost every single aspect of Indian society, history, knowledge, what we call today knowledge systems or culture, uh, were actually portrayed as very barbaric and, uh, and uh, perverse, perverse. And here, James Mill writes, these people indeed are perfectly destitute of historical records. Their ancient literature affords not a single production to which the historical character belongs. I'll tell you in a moment what he need, means by historical character. Then another extremely influential person, but a little more objective was Hegel, the great German philosopher, uh, also writing in the um, early 19th century. And Hegel, as you might know, had a whole very elaborate philosophy of history. And he looked at various civilizations and how they had looked at history. So he writes about India. It is striking that a land so rich in intellectual products and those of the profoundest order of thought has no history. What is known of Indian history has for the most part been communicated through foreign channels. The native literature gives only indistinct data. So this is a far more moderate tone and we we'll basically my uh, presentation is to assess what is valid or not so valid in this statement. Another well-known and of course extremely influential uh, view of Indian history is, is that of Karl Marx. Uh, Karl Marx, unlike Hegel, had no interest in India's intellectual achievements. He was looking at the historical development and he wrote in 1853, so a few decades after Hegel, he wrote, India could not escape the fate of being conquered. This is at the conclusion of a long development on the, the, the shortcomings of Indian society. And the whole of her past history, if it be anything, is the history of the successive conquests she has undergone. In other words, the history of uh, uh, Indian society has no history at all, at least no known history. The only history, in other words, is the history of successive invasions. What we call its history is but the history of the successive intruders who founded the empires on the passive basis of that unresisting and unchanging society. So these two uh, adjectives, unresisting and unchanging, are fairly typical of a number of um, writings which will be very prejudiced uh, towards India and which will portray Indians as basically stagnant, uh, not very much interested in the things of this world, so un, you know, otherworldly, or um, apathetic, or fatalistic. All these stereotypes will be quite um, uh, widespread in the 19th century and will, among other things, apply to India's concept of history. So exactly how does the argument go? Because I could continue these quotations with many more scholars in the 20th century also. It's not that the view disappeared. Uh, uh, many books, uh, many studies portray Indians as lacking a sense of history. So the argument is like this, that first of all, 
you do not find in ancient India historians. Of course, you might argue exactly what or who is a historian, but let us keep it simple. If you compare with the Greek tradition of Heterodotus uh, or Strabo or Arian or the other uh, well-known uh, chroniclers uh, of uh, Greek history, then you have the Roman historians. You do have a tradition of history writing in ancient Greece and Rome at least, uh, for which there is no immediate equivalent in India. So this is one argument. Another is that there are very few. Initially, people said there are no historical chronicles. Later on, they had to revise their judgment, as I will show you later, uh, of the kind that you find in European history. Importantly, you don't find state institutions maintaining historical records, as you will eventually get in Europe or civic records, that is to say, the records of the society. So therefore, there was a conclusion that Indians don't keep any records of the past. I will show, in fact, how India managed this aspect without the state institutions. Um, literary traditions. Now, we will see briefly that there seems to be some history in the literary traditions, but very often there's a tremendous amount of confusion about the who writes what. Uh, some, for example, uh, let us say, to, to take an obvious example, Mahabharata is attributed to Vyasa. But Vyasa is also originally the compiler of the Vedas. Can it be really the same person? Or is it that the, the person or persons who composed the Mahabharata appropriated the name of Vyasa to get all the more sanctity about this work. So these are uh, questions which you encounter for any number of uh, ancient Indian texts and which do not have very easy answers. So for example, MacDonald, who was a prominent British Sanskritist, uh, late 19th and early 20th century wrote, history is the one weak spot in Indian literature. It is in fact non-existent. The whole course of Sanskrit literature suffers from an entire absence of exact chronology. Please note the word exact. It's a fact that if you take texts again of ancient Greece, take Plato, Aristotle, uh, 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 many other writers, you can work out their dates fairly precisely. Not always down to the year, but at least to the decade or two. You can do that. In India, it's not very easy. But if you, if you take even somebody like, say, Kalidasa, uh, there's been a lot of writing on exactly what epoch he belongs to. And even if you accept that he belongs to the Gupta age, which is broadly the consensus, uh, the exact dates remain completely unknown. So, so this is a situation a little peculiar, and uh, therefore this is part of the argument. Then, for those who might have a little acquaintance with the six uh, astika, or in quotation marks, orthodox systems of Indian philosophy, the six darshanas, Mimamsa is one of them. Mimamsa is basically a very complex exercise of commenting on the Vedas to simplify things. And it introduced its, this notion that the Veda is basically eternal. It is not something that was composed at a certain point. It is also a Purushaya, that is to say, literally speaking, non-human, uh, Purusha, not uh, authored by any Purusha. And therefore, it, uh, uh, of course, the intention was to uh, uh, endow the Veda with uh, the utmost sanctity, but did it also do a disservice to the historical aspect that would require us to look at the Veda as a text composed at a certain epoch by a certain identifiable people, in fact, the, the, the rishis who are named in the Vedas, for instance. So this is another uh, line in the argument. Finally, it does look as if we do not have 
travelers' accounts from India. Either of travelers within India, I am referring to ancient times, or to possibly lands abroad. We do know that Indians traveled uh, uh, as much as they liked. They traveled right from Harappan times, they traveled all, the, all over the, uh, you know, what is called the Middle uh, Asian sphere, that is to say all the way to the Middle East. They traveled eastward to uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and so on, and to, and to China. We do not have accounts, as we do, of Greek travelers to India, Arab travelers to India, um, Chinese pilgrims, the famous you know, testimonies of the Chinese pilgrims to India. We do not have an equivalent literature in India. So this is how the argument goes, all of which ends by concluding that there is poor historical awareness among Indians in general, which can be um, noticed, among other things, for example, by this, the, the, the state of neglect that many of our monuments and historical places have in India, that's a fact. Uh, the heritage is poorly managed and poorly uh, preserved. Uh, is that also a manifestation of the lack of historical consciousness? These are the questions that scholars have discussed. Now, before I come to the heart of my argument, I want to pause for a moment because we say no historical consciousness. It assumes that we have at the back of our mind a notion of what history is. And I want, first of all, to show that exactly what is history is something which remains basically in debate. There are many different perspectives. Uh, if I take an extreme perspective at the, during the age of enlightenment, the French philosopher Voltaire uh, who was well known for his you know, constant use of irony in his writings, wrote this, history is the lie commonly agreed upon. In fact, Voltaire was among those, and this role of his is not so well known, who contributed to the genesis of modern history, in a sense of a more rigorous use of sources, and more rigorous discussions also about the validity of the sources and so on. He was one, in a way, one of the architects of modern history. But even if we go to more recent time, this is Will Buham, a well-known American historian who wrote a massive with his wife, uh, a massive nine-volume story of civilization, which is still quite readable. And the first volume in particular, which is called Our Oriental Heritage, has a lot to say about India and Indian civilization. And here he writes, our knowledge of any past event because we would say normally history about is the account of past events, right? This is the common definition. And he says our knowledge of any past event is always incomplete, probably inaccurate, beclouded by ambivalent evidence and biased historians, and perhaps distorted by our own patriotic or religious partisanship. Most history is guessing, and the rest is prejudice. Now, if you you know, delve on such a definition, it's not very optimistic, obviously. Uh, there has to be something more about history, but it also shows us the, you know, hidden pitfalls, hidden to the general public, of what ex exactly history deals with. Finally, I take a a uh, very eminent British anthropologist, not exactly a historian, but an anthropologist of the 20th century, Edmund Le Leach, uh, who wrote uh, just before he passed away, in fact, in a paper uh, very shortly he passed away, something a little deeper, and it merits a minute of reflection, and he writes, the cultural values of Western scholars of the 20th century lead us to believe that good history really records what happened in the past, while bad history does not. Well, he means, good history means we should be masters of, you know, past events as they happen, and we should be able to tell that. And bad history will be, for example, the kind of mythology that I will come to uh, in the Indian context in a slide or two. 
while bad history does not, but the basis on which we can make this kind of distinction is always very insecure. Bad history is seldom constructed out of fantasy. It is simply that we tend to accept as good history whatever is congenial to our contemporary way of thinking. The good history of one generation becomes the bad history of the next. From this point of view, all history is myth, but the converse is not the case. Now again, very apparently radical uh, statement, all history is myth, but it doesn't mean that all history is false. He uses the term myth in the anthropological sense of the term, which means a cultural construct. That's what he means. He simply means that we should abandon the illusion that history can be a, a very faithful, uh, almost mechanical record of past events that doesn't exist. And there is always a lot of coloring that takes place, which is part of myth-making. In fact, just using your common sense, not more than common sense, and a little bit of acquaintance with the field, you can yourself realize that history necessarily suffers from severe limitations. First of all, a historian, except perhaps if you deal with uh, you know, a uh, vibrant Gujarat three days after the event, but otherwise a historian will not have access to a significant, even a significant proportion of the data that he or she would need. And of course the more ancient the period, and the greater the, 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 the lack. Uh, so for example, if we, if we look at ancient India, we do know that there's been a lot of destruction, there's been a lot of disappearance of, of monuments, of documents, of, of texts. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, even if you deal with epigraphy, as I will explain uh, in a few slides, uh, you, you are only dealing with a small fraction of the inscriptions that would have been done at that particular period, etc. So you, you, are, you have to work with a a small fraction, you will never know how much small it is, by the way. You will never be able to tell that I'm using 9% of the available data. You will never know even that. The literary data also is incomplete. That is to say, suppose you have a text, like, for example, uh, the, the, chron the Chronicle of Str Strabo, the, the Greek historian, and he narrates certain things in that case, for example, the campaigns of Alexander the Great uh, uh, through, through uh, Asia and India. Well, that is, of course, a, a most important text, but it doesn't mean that you can believe him at every line. And there will be contradictions, there will be shortcomings, there will be chronological impossibilities, there will be all kinds of things that people critically have to assess later on, but still, uh, we, we, there are things which we cannot neither verify nor contradict. So, so therefore, the literary data can mislead us. Then you have to use certain models of interpretation. And those models, especially in modern history, have kept changing pretty fast. So the way historians work today is very different from you know, the way they were working 100 years ago. And uh, those models, therefore, have their own limitations. Finally, every historian is the product of a certain culture, cannot be helped. And a certain milieu, a certain language, whatever. And this is necessarily going to color. This is true not only of history, it is true also of archaeology, by the way. Uh, you're going to project the way your mind has been constructed into what you read from the past. So these are just kind of explanations of what Edmund Leach means when he says that in a certain sense all history is myth. So we have to relativize history and though we can all broadly agree on a certain modern history, uh, uh, nevertheless it cannot be taken to be the, the, the final ultimate truth about things. And therefore if there are several ways of looking at history, there will also be several ways of looking at what is historical sense. Now, let me come to the case of India and what we've been 
uh, discussing from the beginning. And I will simply suggest a diversity of sources, all of which have something to do with history. Now, how much to do, we'll discuss briefly as we go. But to show you that there is a concern with history, at least at every step. Now, of course, we have to start with the concept of itihasa. And uh, uh, there is an unfortunate thing about itihasa, and that unfortunate thing is that in Hindi, itihas has been taken at school level to be the word for history, you know, as a discipline. That's very unfortunate. It's unfortunate because itihasa is not exactly history, and therefore, you should, itihasa in Sanskrit uh, uh, doesn't mean history. Um, we will first start with the Veda. In the Vedas, which are the most ancient texts we have, there is no pretense of telling history at all. History is not a concern with the Vedas, but you do have some traces of historical events here and there, which might be quite reliable because the purpose of the Veda is not at all to tell you a, uh, uh, any history. So, for example, there is a battle of the Ten Kings, where one king, Sudas, defeats a confederation of uh, uh, ten kings against him. Uh, this is told fairly incidentally, not as a central theme of the Vedas, and therefore we can reasonably assume that this is something that must have happened, and then people try to interpret the details of the, the Veda and find out what it is. Later on, we find the beginning of the Itihasa tradition. It is a tradition, and it is visible especially in the two epics, Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana, do call themselves Itihasa, <coughs> and then the Puranas later will be added to this. So basically, the two epics and the Puranas are what constitutes uh, uh, Itihasa. Itihasa in Sanskrit means Thus indeed it was. Um, thus indeed it was, may be taken to mean, well, this is, this is uh, you know, what happened in the past, but nevertheless, the texts do not actually claim to be real history in the modern sense of the term. It is very clear that it is a mythologized history. Uh, it is also a heroic tradition. You have heroes, of course, as important characters in these two texts. And, but you have a certain historical background in the sense of some major events taking place. Of course, the, the, the great war for the Mahabharata and for the Ramayana, the travel to the south of uh, Rama, Sita, and Lakshmana and their, and their uh, the defeat of uh, uh, Ravana at Lanka. Now, the big question, of course, is did such events occur? And the answer is almost impossible to give in a final way. There are still opinions uh, of, of two camps, and there are also opinions in between, which basically conclude that there must be some historical kernel behind those stories, but how much exactly is very difficult to decide, especially when there is no independent uh, corroboration uh, for, from archaeology in particular. Um, there are sometimes clues. For example, in the Chandogya Upanishad, which is a much earlier text than the Mahabharata, you have a brief mention of somebody called Krishna Devaki Putra. Very brief. There's almost, I mean, among a series of heroes, there is no comment, no explanation, nothing. And in fact, because there is absolutely no development, we can take this name as a genuine name. And perhaps it means that Krishna, uh, as he appears much later in Mahabharata and in Bhagavata, still later in the Bhagavata Purana, uh, was already known to the Upanishads, but, but what kind of a, of a character he was, there's absolutely no clue to, to help us. So the historicity of the text 
still remains in question. Uh, there have been debates from all kinds of angles on archaeology, the internal consistency of the epics themselves. Sometimes some archaeoastronomical uh, archaeo investigations, that is to say looking at the astronomical configurations given in the text and trying to draw conclusions, but unfortunately even those conclusions are never unan unanimous among the scholars. Uh, ultimately, the same conclusion is that uh, historicity, the amount of accuracy that you can attribute to those events uh, is something which will never be decidable. However, what is very clear is that the central purpose of those two texts, the two epics, is actually not to tell history. It is rather to give a teaching to the land, to, uh, a teaching of dharma, and to set a certain cultural framework which was very successfully implemented throughout India uh, uh, through a diversity of renderings, translations, adaptations, and so on. So we cannot, let us be clear, these two Itihasa texts are not history textbooks. In fact, we may say, uh, almost as a joke, but we may say that they, rather than telling history, they made history. That would be a more accurate statement. As far as the Puranas are concerned, yeah, one thing which uh, is clear in those texts, even in the Vedas to some extent, is one historical concept which will be permanent afterwards, and we'll be coming back to it again and again uh, in the next few slides, is the concept of lineage. And the lineage of Rishis, first of all, in the Veda, then the kings, then the teachers in the Upanishads is a concept which is very important. Somehow, ancient Indians want to preserve that memory of who came before and you know how far back we can go. So, this will become very developed in the Puranas, and much of the content of the Puranas, you, I, I hope you all know what Puranas are. They are kind of encyclopedias of ancient India dealing with the gods, the pantheons, the worships, the rituals, the uh, sacred places, the geography, the sometimes also uh, architecture and, and uh, even more mundane disciplines. And, among, and one important aspect is dynasties. How do you establish, how do you reconstruct the past through the, through the medium of dynasty and lineage? They have been very closely studied, especially in the 20th century, after some of them became also translated uh, into English and other European languages. Pajita, who was an eminent uh, uh, scholar and a, a judge uh, in the, I think it was in the Calcutta High Court, if I'm not mistaken, authored a book called Ancient Indian Historical Tradition, which was basically an attempt to synthesize the data arising from the Puranic dynasties and trying to see whether he could make sense of them and reconstruct something that from a historical point of view could stand its ground. And he said there is hardly any doubt that the royal genealogies in the Puranas embody many genuine historical traditions of great antiquity which have not been otherwise preserved. But you see this already brings out the difficulty. If they have not been otherwise preserved, then how will we be able to verify them? Sankalya, a great uh, archaeologist, Indian archaeologist of the 20th century, who did a, was a great pioneer of Indian prehistory in particular, wrote, the Puranas and the Epics alone contain something like a continuous historical narrative, and it is absurd to suppose that the elaborate genealogies were all merely figment of imagination or a tissue of falsehood. Now here, Sankarya and to some extent Pajita are answering 19th century scholars who had a quick look through all these massive dynasties of the Puranas and decided that they were you know, utter rubbish basically and completely unusable. So they kind of protest against this extreme view and, uh, and basically, then, this is the kind of dynastic uh, uh, 
thinking that is reflected through the Puranas, but of course here I have chosen from Pajita's book, I have chosen the original splitting starting from Manu, all the way at the top you have Manu, and on the left you have the Ikshvaku lineage, which is known as the Surya Vamsha. So Vamsha is lineage, if you, if you, if you like, or the Sola dynasty. And here, of course, at the level of Manu, and at this level, we are, let us be frank, we are at the mythological level. There is absolutely nothing verifiable here. But then, we will be slowly moving to the, uh, if you look at the extreme left, to the Ayodhya dynasty. The Ayodhya dynasty will be the dynasty that will eventually uh, have uh, Rama among its members. And, uh, uh, and it continues, and what will happen, okay, let me first continue with this. On, at the other end of the table on the right, you have the Ila uh, dynasty, which is actually the lunar dynasty, or Soma, sometimes Chandra Ramsha, and which will give rise, and you can follow the table, it comes back to your left, and um, uh, it will, it will have some very interesting features because first of all, at some point, it has those five clans, the Yadus, Turvashus, Druyus, Anus, and Purus. And the Purus. And uh, these are interestingly the five clans which you find in the Veda. They are known, or they are assumed to be the Panchajana of the Rig Veda. So this is interesting because these are retrospectively fitted into a grand scheme which actually does not exist in the Rig Veda as such. And if you come down here, you see the Yadavas in particular, where, of which the most illustrious member will be Krishna. So Krishna and Rama are neatly fitted in this scheme. And uh, what happens, and this is very interesting, is that all this is semi-mythological, mm -hmm. Only semi because the five Rig Vedic clans were real clans. The, the, the Rig Veda again mentions them again and again and uh, not at all in a mythological context. So they were existing clans, but the, this is fitted into a broad semi-mythological framework, but the dynasties will continue on and on and on and on. And the Puranas will be full of very long lists, some of them list of 60 kings down the line, which will at some point connect with historically known and attested kings. So it bridges the two worlds, and, uh, and uh, well, this is not actually something uniquely Indian. The Romans also created dynasties that went all the way up to mythological founders of Rome, uh, which are not accepted as historical figures, but then down the line, the, the actual rulers came into the picture. So, so this is a device which needs to be well understood. And uh, if I may take one example, one example of what I mean by bridging the two worlds, many Puranas speak of either 1015 or 1050, sometimes 1500 years between the birth of Parikshit. Who is Parikshit? He was the grandson of uh, Arjuna. You might remember from the Mahabharata. And Mahabharata Nanda, who was an actual historical king of the Nanda dynasty, which uh, ruled uh, in uh, eastern India, and out of which the, the Mauryan Empire will emerge a little later. So you can see how here we are given a time, which incidentally, if you want to work out the date, which is what uh, the great uh, uh, Bengali historian Roy Chaudhary did, uh, which points to a date of 14th century BC from the Mahabharata, but that is not my concern here. The point is, you start with Arjuna here and you go down to uh, Mahabharata, who was a real uh, figure. I am not saying that Arjuna was not a real figure. I am only saying that, and let us be very clear on this, if we go by the current definitions of what is historical or not, we cannot say that Krishna or Rama or Arjuna are historical figures. They may have 
lived very much. But they are not historical figures because we cannot assess them through history. This is very precisely what historical means. It doesn't mean that, uh, for example, I, I often take this example because I find that some, some of our students don't really grasp this concept. If I ask you to tell me who was your great-great-grandfather, for example, maybe some of you would have heard in the family who was your great-great-grandfather. But if I ask you to prove his existence, except for the fact that you are here, there's no other proof. Unless he was somebody well spoken of, documented in some other way, your great-great-grandfather would not be a historical figure. Because apart from you, there's no way for me to prove that this person actually existed. All right? So this is, strictly speaking, what is meant by historical. It is not derogatory to say that somebody is not a historical figure. There's a lot of confusion about this. Um, and then, so when we come to the early historical period, early historical means, broadly speaking, the second half of the first millennium BC. That's what is called early historical, when you begin to have the literature, Buddhist, Jain, Hindu literature, where, where uh, um, uh, all these uh, kings are spoken of. And uh, uh, there, uh, by the assessment of the great uh, Indian historian Asi Majumda, the dynasties found in the Puranas are actually fairly reliable, as they were partly corroborated by the Buddhist literature and archaeological evidence. In fact, that is the whole difficulty of history as an art. It is not a science in the modern sense of science. It's more of an art because you have to combine different sources of uh, information. If you can have something from archaeology, an inscription, if you can have different texts, like the, this Buddhist text, the Puranas, then you can start building a reliable picture. That is the whole challenge. So as I said, the Puranas bridge the mythical and the historical. They are not historical records in the modern sense, but they do have something to do with history uh, in their own way. One uh, digression, brief digression, about the concept of yugas. In fact, interestingly, uh, this I found very fascinating. Um, you know all about the yugas and mahayugas and uh, ma uh, Mangantaras and so on, these colossal cycles of time that are found in texts like Mahabharata and the Puranas. This was actually used in the 19th century by European scholars to show that Indians had no sense of history. Because they said, how can they deal with those ridiculously long period of time? You know, it's so absurd. Now, recently, two, three scholars in the last uh, decade or so, and I'm going to use just one today, have used the argument exactly in the opposite sense to show that there is something very interesting about uh, the, these four yugas. First of all, you know the four yugas, Satya, Okrita, Treta, Dwapar, and the Kali. Now, these, there is of course a completely uh, arbitrary and very neat geometric sequence 4,800, 3,600, 2,400, and 1,200 years res respectively. So the, the, the ratios are 4 to 3 to 2 to 1, which add up to 12,000 years. That's not the duration you are used to, right? In fact, because to get to the proper yoga scale of the Puranas, you have to consider that these years are divine years. They are not human years. And what is a divine year? It's a human year in 2360. So when you multiply, this is what you get, 4 millions, uh, etc. And this will be multiplied a thousand times and then doubled, etc. And this is how we come to the you know, famous uh, kalpa of 8.64 billion years, uh, which uh, famously the American um, astronomer Carl Sagan notice was pretty close to the actual age of the universe. Anyway, that is just an amusement. But, more interestingly, there are some descriptions in these yugas which are very strange. 
For example, in the Kripta, people took refuge by the mountains and oceans having neither houses nor shelters. So they don't have houses. They just live in caves or, or near the ocean, and they don't practice agriculture. These are actual descriptions from many Puranas, especially the Vishnu Purana, which has very long descriptions of these yogas. In Treta, there is mention of extremes of climate, and therefore people taking, having to take shelter in houses and becoming sedentary, they start practicing agriculture and trade. These are actual mentions in the Puranas. In the Dwapara now, we have decadence because as you know, the four yugas tell a tale essentially of decadence, degradation, loss, and ultimately a pranaya and then a new creation. That's how it goes. So in the Dwapara, there is decadence of the society. There are droughts, diseases, and deaths. But at the same time, the schools of the Vedas and the Shastras are set to develop at that time. And finally, as we know, the Kali, final loss of Dharma, droughts and famines are indicated, spread of diseases and final collapse. Now, what's interesting here is that if you forget about this factor of 360, and you take it as actually 12,000 years, <clears throat> is it a coincidence or not? But, and this was the thesis of, uh, of Peter Eltsov, a, a, a Americano-Russian scholar in particular, it is very much the tale of the Holocene. What is the Holocene? It is the last 12,000 years after the last ice age, when uh, humanity started uh, expanding with the global warming that followed, which is very precisely 12,400 years ago, uh, the end of the uh, last ice age, and for a while people were still, that is called the Mesolithic, technically speaking, people were still uh, go, uh, living in uh, cave shelters, uh, they were still uh, uh, hunters and gatherers, so therefore not practicing agriculture. And then you had the Neolithic age, where people settled down, and there were indeed climatic changes. People settled down, started practicing agriculture, and with agriculture trade also followed. And, uh, and then, if we have to follow this comparison, it would be the Dwapara. You have the Bronze Age, where civilizations arise and uh, uh, becomes much more sophisticated and so on. So, um, Elsof, and he's not the only one, proposes that this could be a kind of allegory for these, uh, this evolution of the last 12,000 years. I do not want to push it too far, but uh, this is something that merits consideration because uh, the, the parallel of the social, the description of the society in particular is quite close. Now, you know, I hope, what is epigraphy? It is the science of inscriptions. And uh, India has well over a lakh possibly even two lakhs. In fact, nobody knows. I try to find out the number. Nobody really knows because a lot of inscriptions are still unread. They are documented, they have been, <coughs> the print has been taken, but they have not been read, they have not been dis published at all. And the offices of the Archaeological Survey of India are still full of piles and piles of unread inscriptions. The large majority of inscriptions in India are located in the south, this is mostly for historical reasons. Uh, there was much more warfare and, and disruption in the north. And these inscriptions, well, this is well known, so I will move a little fast. Uh, according to D.C. Sirkar, one of possibly the greatest Indian epigraphists of the 20th century, contained not only much information on, as we know, warfare and kings and dynasties and uh, politics, that's uh, reasonably well known. But he said there is no aspect of the life, culture, and activities of the Indians that is not reflected in inscriptions. So almost every aspect of the social life can be documented here or there. Whether it is digging, sometimes simply digging a pond, building a dam, uh, predicting an eclipse, 
or making an offering in the temple, etc., etc. Nothing is too small for inscriptions, and that's what makes them so fascinating. So I, I, I'll move on because this is my own, and I, I'm not here to uh, give you a history course. Uh, you, the, among the first batch of uh, the best known inscriptions, possibly not the earliest, but anyway, among the very earliest are Ashoka's edicts, where Ashoka not only um, <coughs> spoke of his military conquests, but more than that, gave his view of life, his um, passionate adherence to Dharma, or Dhamma, Dhamma as it is in Pali, and um, uh, uh, and frankly, and basically wanted to give a teaching to his subjects uh, uh, as to how they should behave and how the society is to run smoothly. So, uh, so this is actually much more of a social message and an ethical message than a political one. One well-known inscription uh, not far from here in Girnar, uh, Junagar, the inscription of uh, Rudradama. Uh, very interestingly, engraved on the same rock that has a very long edict by Ashoka, known as the Gir Girnar Edict. Uh, it's, they share the same rock, but a few hundred years apart. And here for the first time, first time in India, that we have a dated inscription. That's why I mentioned it. It comes with the date. Ashoka didn't, give, didn't attempt to give his dates. But here it says it is the year 72. That's all. So historians assume that this is 72 of the Shaka era. It could have been other, and they often were, other local eras, which makes the job of historian very difficult at times because you have to decide which era is, is in use. And this is basically about the repair of a lake nearby, which was uh, dug out during Ashoka's time, but went into disrepair and had to be restored. <coughs> so this is the purpose of the inscription. <coughs> and uh, if you're going to give a date to an inscription, well, we could argue that it means you have some historical sense at least. Because if you have no historical sense, why should you take the trouble of dating it. Uh, then, one very famous inscription is that of Samudra Gupta, the uh, famous Allahabad pillar. And once again, this Allahabad pillar first has a Nashokan inscription, and then different rulers use other size, unwritten size of the uh, pillar and add their own. And this is about not only military conquest, state structure, but also Samudras Gupta's talent for music and poetry. And here we have a kind of praise, uh, because the, the uh, inscription is composed by a, a poet, very probably a court poet. And uh, this kind of praise of the ruler is something that will become, or is already, in fact, a kind of a standard uh, in Indian inscriptions. You know, the, the, the ruler has to be praised. Now, this creates difficulties for the historian because you will never be able to assess certain things. For example, when a king tells you, he tells you in an inscription that his rule is as great as the rule of Rama. In South India, we even have a king who boasts that he excelled Rama in every aspect. You know. So these, of course, are things which cannot be quantified and uh, have to be taken with a pinch of salt. And unfortunately, therefore, do not convey very useful information on the actual state of the society during his time. So, so uh, this is one uh, problem. <coughs> we have sources through coins. Now, kings issue coins for two reasons. One is for their own glory, but that will come later. The first coins, as I will show you, uh, in fact, let me show you right now. This is, the, this is typical of the first kind of coins that existed in India. Anybody knows their name? The, they are known as the 
No, no, no. Well, that is one aspect of that. But they are classified as the punch marked coins because they are made of silver and they, they come about from 600 BC onward, uh, even before the Mauryan times. They don't have any effigy, any representation of the ruler. Uh, there are only symbols whose exact meaning has not been properly deciphered. It might be about value, it might be about the kingdom. Uh, there, there's, there are hundreds of symbols on those punch mark coins, and the, 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 the symbols were punched with a, a die, an iron die, into the soft silver. This is how these symbols were made. So uh, thousands of them have been found, and these are the coins which were in operation during the Mauryan times. So we do not, for example, we do not have a coin with the effigy of Ashoka. It doesn't exist. Later on, and I think this is first of all with the Kushan, Kushana dynasty, you will have coins with the effigy of the ruler, in this case, uh, uh, Kanishka. Now, some historians have said, and it's quite possible, though uh, as very often impossible to prove, some historians have said that this is the influence of the uh, contact with the Greeks and the Romans who were using effigies on their coin. Quite possible. Now, I'm showing this coin in particular for one important reason. On the uh, obverse, as it is called technically, on the left, you have Kanishka. On the reverse, on the right, what do you have? Anybody can guess? Actually, you can read it. You can read who is depicted. Yes, yes. Yes, exactly. Buddha. See, in Greek, beta, omega, delta, delta, omega. Buddha. So this is the Buddha. And um, it's interesting that <coughs> um, uh, this is, uh, uh, Kanishka was an invader from Central Asia uh, who came and militarily conquered and dominated a large part of North India uh, during his time. And uh, also of what is known as Bactria, that is to say present Turkmenistan in Central Asia. Bactria was an area very closely connected to India, and there were still relics of the um, empire of Alexander the Great there, and uh, therefore, the, therefore the Greek letters, because he would have wanted this coin to be current also in Bactria. But it also speaks of his devotion to Buddha, because in fact, uh, the Kushanas adopted Buddhism uh, once they came into India, and though therefore they were military conquerors, you might say that culturally they were conquerors. This is a coin of Samudra Gupta, <coughs> uh, about 350. Uh, CEC, for those who don't know, means common era. Huh? This is the current terminology. Instead of AD, it's the same as AD. So what you see here on the left is there are lots of royal emblems and symbols here. And here now the coin is completely to the glory of the ruler. Uh, he gives his religious affiliation through one clue on the obverse of the coin. What is that clue? Can anybody make out? It was keen sense of observation. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Excuse me? Um, he shows his religious affiliation, or affiliation maybe is not the right term, but let us say the, the particular sampradaya that, uh, 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 that he has chosen. Is it, is it uh, you know, the affiliation to Shiva? Well, not quite. It is actually to Vishnu. And why is it to Vishnu? Because on this royal staff, you can see a bird, and the bird is Garuda. So Garuda is actually uh, um, here taken as a royal emblem, and therefore it means Vishnu. So there's of course a whole very complex iconography, that is to say, science of symbols, uh, which, uh, which comes into play at the level of uh, the coins, and uh, which requires a lot of expertise. <coughs> 
Agwal, uh, because the Mughals also issued many coins, uh, all, actually all dynasties did. We also had foreign coins, for example, brought by the Romans at some point. So this is a, the, actually the orthodox Islamic declaration of faith. You know about Prophet Muhammad and uh, uh, Allah and so on. But Akbar also issued different kinds of coins, and this was issued by him, and it depicts, can you make out on the left? Yes, it is Rama Sita. So it depicts uh, Rama and Sita because Akbar happened to be a great fan of the Ramayana story. And he had it told in his court, and he issued several coins, not just this one, to commemorate the <coughs> Ramayana. So it shows his breadth of mind. Uh, well, to show different region of India, this is um, from the Ahom kingdom of modern Assam and uh, the 17th century, so much later, and now you can, of course, also make out the modernity of the script. And so, so uh, numismatics is an incredibly rich field and uh, very, very complex. And keep in mind, again, that we have published only a very small portion of the coins available, and the coins available are a very small portion of the coins that would have been current. This should always be remembered. Now I move on to different, uh, uh, some, uh, now this is, let us say, the second aspect. So far I have shown you <coughs> fairly well-known classical sources of Indian history. Now I'm going to move to other lesser known areas. <coughs> Historical chronicles. Remember the first argument? India had no historical chronicles. Well, or very few. Well, the personal exception is the Raja, I'm sorry, uh, there is a complete mystery. It is Raja Tarangini, not as spelled, of Kalhana in Kashmir, which was composed in the 12th century CE. <clears throat> it was a fairly long text, 7,800 verses, in poetry, therefore, and it tells basically the history of Kashmir before his times, seen through the, the again, the dynastic lineage, the, the royal dynasties. <coughs> and um, uh, uh, what's extremely interesting, so it has been criticized as sometimes indulging a little bit of mythology, uh, mythology sometimes um, having inconsistencies, internal contradictions uh, in the dates, etc. There have been some criticism, but by and large, it's regarded as fairly reliable, and all historians of Kashmir have consulted it very closely. But what I find remarkable is that <clears throat> at the beginning, among the very first verses, he sets out a proper historical method. And this is something which you do not find, to my knowledge, in, in any other Indian text. So uh, using the translation of, <coughs> of Mark Orenstein, a, a British uh, scholar, uh, he writes, Kalhana writes, that noble-minded poet alone is worthy of praise, whose word, like that of a judge, keeps free from love or hatred in relating the facts of the past. So therefore, when you look at the past, you should be dispassionate, right? That's number one. Number two, my endeavor is to give a connected account when the narrative of past events has become fragmentary in many respects. So he understands that much of the past is already lost. It's fragmented. But he's going to try to fill the gaps. That's what exactly the job of a historian is. <coughs> Eleven works of former scholars containing the chronicles of the kings I have inspected. So he refers to sources. He's, he has studied 11 uh, earlier chronicles, and he criticized them pretty heavily for being unreliable and so on, but nevertheless he uses them. That's again what a good historian should do. And finally, by looking at the inscriptions 
he also goes to inscriptions available in his time and he studies them regarding the consecration of temples and grants by former kings at laudatory inscriptions, the praises, and at written works, the trouble arising from many errors has been overcome. Well, that's pretty much what a modern historian would do. So we have to admire at least the, the, the modernity of his uh, approach to history. You have lots of other texts which qualify as partly or wholly as historical chronicles. I'm not going to trouble you. I think you can read all these, most of which are unpublished, except for the first and possibly the second. Yes, the second is published. Uh, the subsequent texts are, to my knowledge, not available. And possibly only the first is available in an English translation. But these texts, Asha Charita, Vikram Deva Charita, and so on, are very important testimonies of the, 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 the life, political and social, during a particular ruler. So all the others are just spoken of, but hardly any historian has even seen them. So therefore, we are working with very limited sources. The texts exist, the manuscripts exist, but either they have not been published or if they are published, it's in some obscure publication which people do not consult or access. Then you have, in addition, very important regional chronicles of a historical character. I'll take the example, there are many, in fact it runs into hundreds, literally speaking. I will take the example of Lieutenant Colonel Todd, who was an officer in the uh, uh, British East India Company uh, in what was known as Rajputana in those days. And he was also a very good scholar who collected a huge amount of uh, traditional folklore, history, um, uh, customs from Rajasthan. And he published it in a monumental three volume, Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, which is still uh, consulted very much today by all historians of Rajasthan in particular. Now, in one book, he explains how he uses a local chronicle known as Komar Pal Charitra, which is 38,000 stanza verses. That's huge. That's a huge. That means a very long text, composed in the second, in, in the 12th century, by a Jain scholar. Jains, in fact, were also very good at writing their own chronicles. And their chronicles are even less known than those I showed you in the previous slide. And this is about a particular king of, uh, known as Komar Pal of that period in Rajasthan. And uh, it is through this chronicle that Todd is able to reconstruct that part of, of the history of Rajasthan. So uh, this he got with great difficulty. He had to procure the manuscript with difficulty. I do not even know whether it is available in a publishable form uh, today. Uh, but this is typically the kind of sources which are very badly neglected. He found that he could confirm the general accuracy of the Charitra. And when he summarized it, he said, my summary of it, of the, this Charitra, this uh, Chronicle is more especially addressed to those who continue blindly to assert that the Hindus have no such thing as historical works of any kind. So he protests against the stereotype that there are no historical <coughs> records in India. He actually mentioned several other charitras, and he connected, this is uh, very important, but I'll not be able to uh, devote time to it, he collected a lot of folk, local folklore, and one aspect of that folklore was historical ballads. Now, the ballads are a kind of art form, a specialized art form, especially in North India, where you have normal, uh, traveling communities who go from town to town, city to city, sometimes village to village, and sing the great deeds of a particular king. 
So this also contains nuggets of, uh, for example, we heard in Uttar Pradesh about a lot of balance having to do even with the mutiny, the so-called mutiny, the first uh, war of rebellion of 1857, which uh, triggered the composition of a lot of popular balance, which is how, in fact, much of the common people get to know about those events, because they don't they wouldn't have gone to school in those days. They don't uh, study history books. And therefore, this is a major medium uh, which is not regarded as part of mainstream history. And nevertheless, it has to do with history. There is another tradition, very important, called Vamsavali. We have actually already touched upon it a little bit. Vamsa is the lineage. But we are no longer here talking about the Puranic lineage. We are talking about people, communities, who maintain the records of these lineages. And uh, uh, th there are uh, spread over large parts of India, especially the north. We have lots of Vamsavadis from Rajasthan, Himachal, Orisha, Gujarat, and also Nepal. Now, what are these Vamsavadis? They are simply, they are not books extolling the deeds of so-and-so, they are simply records of a whole clan or a whole community. And uh, the, the dynasties, the, the successive uh, uh, genealogies, and uh, also the, the locations where this community lived, if it moved to another place and so on. So these are actually historical records, which if you wanted to have a very detailed in history of that particular region, you would need to consult. But they are not consulted because most of them are not published at all. They are just available with some communities. Um, the historian Rovina Tapar writes that there is scope for comparative studies of the Vamsavali as a historical tradition that had currency in many parts of the subcontinent. What these texts suggest is that far from there being an absence of history, there was a deep involvement with the past and its historically recognizable form. But you can begin to feel, perhaps, that this is not a conventional textbook way of recording or telling history. It's, it's a localized, regionalized way of dealing with history, but nevertheless maintaining historical facts. So let us see uh, quickly a few examples. The Pandas, you've heard of the Pandas who sometimes harass you in uh, North Indian temples. Well, one of their functions was actually to maintain those genealogies. And uh, in the North in particular, they maintain those records which are called Vahis. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, uh, those records are very meticulously uh, compiled a massive, in fact, enormous records. Uh, they run into hundreds of years. And they are used sometimes in the, in, in, in the court of law in litigation today. Because if somebody wants to prove that he was, you know, his family owned this particular land uh, uh, in the 19th century, you might not have official records. Uh, so you might have to go to these records, and sometimes courts have accepted them as valid. So this is also a way to, of recording history. Well, I've mentioned the, the, the ballad tradition of North India. These, uh, these ballads were uh, trans composed, performed, and transmitted by specific Bardic communities especially in Rajasthan and Gujarat, they have been somewhat studied at a social level, but the content of the balance, unfortunately, is still very little known. Uh, this is another way of dealing with history. For example, you have one community called the Bhat, or Bharat community. In Gujarat, they are more known as Bharat and elsewhere as Bhat. And they are in Himachal, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, Haryana, Punjab, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan, so pretty much the whole of North India. And they keep detailed genealogies as well as records of the rulers' deeds. And they are not Brahmins. They, they belong to, uh, technically, they are landowners. Some of them are even agricultural laborers. 
So there are a lot of Brahmins, so it is not exclusively a Brahmin occupation of keeping those genealogies. In fact, um, uh, there's a very interesting remark by the great Indian sociologist, M. N. Srinivas, who writes, uh, you know that he studied the phenomenon of Sanskritize, what he called Sanskritization, which is not a very, very good term, but it means the upward social migration. In the days where, you know, caste was not fixed by, uh, for example, the reservation system, uh, there was much more fluidity, and eventually it was documented the mechanisms in, by which low caste would try to migrate upward in the caste system. So he, uh, this is what he calls sensitization. So he says the Barots, in the course of their work, bring local lineages and clans into contact with regional, if not all in their myths and history. Please note, myths and history. The lineages and clans concern desire to raise themselves in the local hierarchy, and the history and myths recorded in the books of the Baros help them in their ascent. This results in linking the Barots, no, in linking the myth and history intimately with the people concerned. The Barots thus bring the little and great tradition together. What is the little tradition? It is the tradition of the clan, the local regional tradition. The great tradition is something that connects everybody together. For example, the two epics, Mahabharata or Ramayana, are part of this great tradition because anybody in India can somehow attach himself to that, that greater story. They also stimulate the sensitization of the way of life of the people they minister to, which means they actually create in the people the, a desire to rise in the social hierarchy. It is essential to realize that the Barot, who enables members of other castes to push themselves up in the hierarchy, is himself part of the caste system, and he has modeled himself on his most important patron, the Rajput. So here, I bring this quotation to show you how the telling of the history in fact, creates a new history. It changes the, the fact of telling history here by this particular Bhatta or Bharat community is going to have an impact on the society itself. So it is not something that is just dead. Here, history, though it is not, again, mainstream, modern, conventional, textbook type of history, it is actually living history which is told and which is reshaping the history of the present. I think these uh, uh, subtle aspects are usually not grasped or not highlighted. Finally, uh, for those uh, uh, other ways of keeping history, this is a community in Karnataka. And more or less the echo of what I told you just now in North India, this is the Helava community. And they are traditional archivists. They keep with them, they document and keep with them the genealogy of almost all families in every village and town in all these districts. You can read them. So a big part of Karnataka. And they have with them, though it is not computerized, completely handwritten, and kept up to date through a very systematic, regular, visit circular, you know, revisiting of all the towns and villages, they keep with them the uh, genealogies of almost all those families and people who wish to know their ancestry. If you want to find out information of that great, great grandfather I was telling you about earlier, well, these are the kind of people that you would have to go to and they would be able to tell you. They would know exactly uh, and, and they would keep, it's almost like a register of births and deaths at the same time. They will keep, along with the names, uh, a to track of all the managers, the births, the deaths in that particular family. So it's a stupendous work for which, of course, they receive a little bit uh, uh, token payment, but uh, it shows that they are driven 
at bottom by a desire to preserve something of the past. Otherwise, why should people bother about this if Indians had no sense of history? Um, some of you might know that uh, if you belong to a family that has been involved in business, you know, those traditional business families, you, you can check out, but uh, you will be often told that uh, somebody in the family is keeping a record you know, of the past generations. And uh, many traditional, uh, for example, Marwari families in particular, but not only, they do this. So this is also a way of keeping history. There are actually more historical sources. Well, I've mentioned the Baas. There is a certain class of Kavya literature, especially in the Middle Ages, which actually tells some past event in, in a poeticized form. So I take the example of this Kanthadade uh, Pramantha, uh, which is a, a text which I, I mention it because by some miracle it's available in English. Very, very few of these texts are. And it tells, it's a very graphic account of the Muslim conquest of Gujarat uh, in the Sultan, uh, Sultanic uh, period and the fall of two important Rajput principalities after a brave fight. So the Hindu rulers are portrayed, of course, in a very heroic tone. Uh, their wives are shown also as very heroic and, uh, you know, committing suicide before the final defeat. And so there is great pathos, great intensity. Uh, uh, and uh, it also shows, by the way, that uh, people you know, remember those events and uh, uh, they were present somehow in the popular consciousness. And uh, this is, so this is the kind of literature which is not much explored by uh, standard historians, let us see. You have even some monuments which are uh, uh, erected Sometimes, of course, victory towers and the more imposing monuments, which are known, but even humble hero stones, you know, no more than two feet or three feet in height. Uh, they are those you find especially in South India, and they basically tell local history. They basically are about a, a you know, a war won by a chieftain, or the, the <coughs> how uh, somebody sacrificed himself to a goddess and things like that. So this is another way of keeping history. Finally, these Thala Puranas. What are these Thala Puranas? They are Puranas attached to a particular temple. And those are heavy in mythology, very, very heavy in mythology. Nevertheless, they almost invariably contain a little bit of regional history. So, I think, and oral traditions, of course, not to be neglected. Apart from the balance, people do remember. And uh, they remember, of course, in ways which will not be accurate, which may be embellished. But nevertheless, there may be still a nugget of information in, in the, uh, those memories. So let me conclude. We have, in India, First of all, in the literature, what I call a semi-mythologized concept of history. It is uh, not standard history, that's okay, but it is also another way of dealing with history, and especially if we remember that uh, all history is to some extent a, a construct, this is also another construct. India tended not to try and build a whole national history, but rather to regionalize it. And uh, to have a lot of local, very great diversity and richness of local histories. Uh, so they are sometimes hero-centered, they glorify the ruler, but they are uh, nevertheless history after all. And the oral part of it should not be neglected. All history need not be textual, need not be in a written form. History can also come in oral forms. Diverse mechanisms for genealogical record keeping. So overall, I would say 
my own assessment is that history is much alive in India's collective consciousness. Sometimes you feel that perhaps it's even too alive uh, because you know a lot of uh, things from the past continue to live on, uh, not always with very happy results. So, in any case, it is just at the end of the day that India's approach to the past is different from that of Europe. And this is not surprising because that's what distinguishes cultures and civilizations. Uh, in the same way as India did mathematics in a way that Greeks did not do mathematics, it was totally different. In the same manner as you know, systems of governance and polity evolved in India, which were totally different from European systems, uh, in the same way, the, the concept of history, the practice of history, has also been very different. So this is basically a cultural difference, and, uh, uh, it is, and, and this cultural difference is something that, uh, that has to be respected, and today's historians at least now have understood that and have accepted that since there cannot be one narrative of history, it's impossible, Therefore, all these different approaches to history have their own validity. So we have to nuance, we have to research, verify, accumulate the data as much as possible. But nevertheless, the notion that India had no sense of history, I think, is no longer defended by any sound scholar. Rather, instead of trying to answer this question, the, the approach now is to understand the different kind of a history that India actually practiced. And uh, then, of course, the problem that follows this realization is something that you can immediately understand. And it is that we have a clash between the kind of history which is taught at school and the kind of history that was traditionally practiced, conveyed, transmitted, elaborated in <coughs> India. They are not the same. So therefore, therefore, even you know, uh, uh, ordinary Indian students, after taking the history course, assuming that they paid any attention to the history course, uh, they do come out often convinced that yes, there's something wrong with uh, Indian history. But there is nothing wrong with Indian history. There is some, simply a need to understand the cultural difference and. Uh, uh, then, then the Indian way of constructing history takes its full meaning. So thank you for your attention.